Hi, Jim. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm okay. Um, I'm sitting here in the office at uh, Forest House in uh, Lower Manhattan. Oh, do we have to kind of like display the, the prestige publisher that, that, that we just published a book with? I mean, couldn't you have waited a minute or two for me to introduce this? Uh, so sorry. I walked through uh, uh, many, many blocks of traffic choked uh, 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 streets and I've been inhaling carbon monoxide. So I'm not my normal self. I, I'm, I'm sorry. You're not your normal self. The normal yeah. Jim Holt would not be showing off in that fashion. I didn't intend to. I, I'm. Uh, well, you uh, should be. No, seriously, you should show up. Let me introduce. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available in both streaming, video, and audio podcasts. You are Jim Holt, author of this book, When Einstein Walked with Gerdel. I guess is close to a pro an acceptable pronunciation. Excursions to the edge of thought. Uh, I in introducing you, I can do no better than Vanity Fair did when they wrote about you when your last book was published, which was called Why Does the World Exist? And by the way, we hope to answer that question before the end of this conversation. Of they course. wrote, New Yorker Jim Holt has established himself as an invaluable fixture in the most sophisticated conversations about philosophy, physics, mathematics, and theology today as an author and essayist for the New York Times and the New York Review of Books. That's what they said. And we might add, you've written for some other periodicals as well. And many of the essays you wrote are compiled in this book. And I want to say one more thing about this book, which is that it's quite an honor for a prestige publisher like Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, one of the true literary publishers, to want to publish your collected essays. Because, you know, publishers don't actually like to publish collected essays. I know. I had to dragoon them into doing it. You know, they, they would have, I would not have succeeded even after that much effort. When I suggest to publishers that they publish my collected essays, they're like, um, you know, we'll get back to you. <laughs> well, I'm sorry that you should try a more abject approach. That's always worked for me. Did you actually get on your knees? You... Uh, no comment. <laughs> okay. Whatever works, whatever works, Jim. This is really, uh, and I got to say, you deserve the honor uh, because you are, you are such a crisply authoritative writer and you write about such cosmic and profound things. And yet the crisp authority remains. Uh, and, and, and I want to... Now, so the title is, this is like the title essay, When Einstein Walked with Gerdel. But as it, so, so this, that essay constitutes only a small fraction of this vast and rich book. But as it happens, I would like to spend a certain amount of time on Einstein and Gerdel. Good. Because for one thing, I have uh, more than passing connection with Princeton, the town in which they did their walking together. Here, the, the picture on the, on, the, on the jacket is of them walking presumably walking home from work or to work or something. They walked home from work, according to you, when they were both at the Institute for Advanced Study and, uh, and became friends. And, uh, and, and uh, they're both of you could spend hours on, e you know, trying to understand either of them. We're going to spend hours, over, lifetimes, lifetimes <laughs> and still not succeed. But we are going to spend less than an hour and deal with both of them. And yet we are going to succeed. Because we've got you to guide us. So let's start with Gerdel. Now, when I was actually... By the way, Bob, I, I, would, I would try... Uh, uh, Gerdel is closer. Is Gerdel closer? Yeah. yeah. But, but yours that is actually, sounds more like an undergarment, right? Um, perhaps. <laughs> you see the logic of what I've been doing here, Jim? Yes, I'm trying to avoid... Let's not pull down the tone so early. <laughs> Girdle. Okay, yeah. girdle. It's oh, it's an O with an umlaut in German. Yeah, but but your pronunciation was close. I've heard goidel is the one that I, I simply won't abide. Or go, or godel or or godel. Yeah. By the way, was was it, this isn't at all a play on the phrase "walked with God," is it? Did you, did that come to mind? Uh, I mean, that that would take a mispronunciation of. No. Of, no. I wanted to call it Einstein on the beach, but that was already taken. That was taken. Yeah. yeah and Einstein looked terrible in a speedo, also. Yes. Not God. to mention a. Never mind. Uh, so, but, but seriously, folks, so, so when I was an undergraduate, as it happens at Princeton University, the book that was all the rage was Gerdel Escherbach, or Gerdel Escherbach, as you might put it, by Douglas Hofstadter. I mean, it was the book you were supposed to have pretended to have read, and many tried, and, and I tried, and I got partway through it, but, uh, you know, he was, uh, so he was a cool person to think about. Uh, and, and I think Douglas Hofstadter probably does have a pretty solid understanding of the incompleteness theorem. 
I don't, and, and so you're going to help me out here. But first, let's talk about what a strange man he was. Yes, he was a um, uh, very fastidious, more than a bit paranoid. He had a, he had a morbid dread of refrigerator gases. He lived on a diet of uh, butter and laxatives. He was, uh, uh, he believed that, um, interesting, he was, he, you know, of course he was Austrian. And uh, although he wasn't Jewish, uh, he was, he left uh, Austria shortly after the Anschluss when the uh, Nazis rolled in. Uh, his wife was a, was a torch singer uh, uh, named Adele in a uh, club called the Moth in, um, in uh, Vienna. And uh, he was attacked by some Nazi thugs on the streets of Vienna and his wife was with him and she fought them off with her umbrella. But that was enough for Gödel. So they ended up coming. He had been at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton before and they were eager to have him back because he had recently proved the incompleteness theorems, which you know, a huge bombshell in 20th century thought. Uh, and so they ended up in a little house in Princeton and his wife put a, a pink flamingo on the front lawn, which Gödel thought was... Was, was, was very tasteful. He pronounced it Herzlich uh, Furchtbar, uh, which is awfully charming. Um, and well, uh, in fairness to him, maybe it had not yet become a cliche uh, that was no, it, mocked it, by the John Waterses of the world. <laughs> it had not yet become ironic, that's true. Right. Um, Gödel was, uh, towards the end of his life, he died in 1977, uh, and he had been... Um, awarded the Presidential uh, Medal of Science, but he refused to go to Washington to receive it from Gerald Ford because he thought there, were, there was a plot to assassinate him, Gödel. And, uh, he, and in fact, he was so paranoid, he believed there was a universal conspiracy to poison him. And so he stopped eating food uh, and therefore starved himself. That has a downside. That has much the effect that poisoning itself has in the long yeah, run. Yeah, he died of a, he died of a paradox in, in, in a sense. Uh, he weighed 70 pounds, uh, when he died at the Princeton Hospital of uh, a paranoid uh, uh, inanition and self-starvation. Um, a tragic life. Uh, I would argue, though, that he lived a life very much worth living, despite all of his, uh, his uh, peculiarities, some of which were morbid. Uh, he, um, he created these abstract self-referential -refer structures of astonishing beauty and power, who ever imagined that arithmetic formulas could be made to talk about themselves, to say, I am not provable. And you alluded earlier to um, Douglas Hofstadter, who wrote the book Gödel, Escher, and Bach in, uh, in the 1970s. Hofstadter believed that Gödel's uh, construction of self-referential structures in mathematics exactly paralleled the emergence of the self in consciousness. Uh, he thought, he, he called it a strange loop that uh, Gödel was able to make mathematical formulas in effect talk about themselves and refer to themselves. Mm -hmm. this, this, he, this he called a strange loop. And he said, this is the essence of, uh, of personhood, and the essence of what it is for the, the self to emerge from this, uh, this uh, sort of tangle of neurons in our head. Uh, I don't believe- so, Self-reference self and ultimately self-awareness kind of emerges. Yes, yes, precisely. Uh, and I, I think that's a slightly inflated uh, claim uh, for Gödel, but his work is very susceptible to uh, philosophical, uh, uh, philosophical speculation. Uh, Roger, Sir Roger Penrose, the great mathematical physicist, mm -hmm. believes that, uh, that, uh, it, that because we can see the truth of Gödel's formula that says, I am not provable, but it's not provable within a mathematical system. That means that human consciousness outstrips the power of any mathematical system, and therefore any computer. Right. Uh, and, and that too, I think, is a claim that's, uh, that's as, as heady as it is, it's, it's incorrect. Right, it's funny. I just had a conversation with Stuart uh, Hameroff, who is a collaborator of Penrose's on a particular theory of quantum consciousness. So we talked about this a little, and, and, and so you're right. So Penrose, as I understand it, the way he applied uh, Gödel's uh, theorem was to conclude that understanding cannot arise, true understanding cannot arise from within a strictly computational system. And uh, in, in this case, uh, like, like that's why he, he says AI, as conventionally done, cannot produce understanding. 
true understanding. And in fact, it is quantum effects that are coming in, in some sense, from the outside that are integral to the, the mm -hmm. congealing of actual understanding in the human mind. Now, there's, did you want to say something about that? Uh, no, I, only to add that I'm, I'm extremely skeptical of that approach to consciousness. And I, I, I don't I, think... I'm skeptical of all approaches yeah. to consciousness myself, but uh, <laughs> if the claim is that they've explained it, I'm skeptical. But, um, but, but, uh, but what, what's interesting is that, you know, and I want to, maybe we should talk a little about this before we get into the actual guts of the incompleteness theorem. Um, is it another thing, one, one thing that Penrose has in common uh, with uh, Gödel, and I didn't know this was true of Gödel until I read this essay of yours, uh, Gödel was a, a Platonist in, in the sense of believing that mathematical truths are kind of out there in some sense, and we're discovering them, and there's this kind of realm where they exist and would exist independent of human inquiry, right? And Penrose was the same uh, was this, is, is, is one of those as well. Both of them yeah. are Platonists, and... As are many other great living mathematicians, by the way. That, that's probably the, the predominant point of view among in the mathematical tribe, uh, as far as I can tell. The last time I gave a lecture at the uh, Mathematical Sciences Research Institute at Berkeley, I asked for a show of hands how many of the mathematicians there, you know, this is the mathematical elite of the world, consider themselves Platonists in the sense they believe that mathematical reality is out there and they're like astronomers looking out at constellations and galaxies of mathematical structures. And about two thirds to three quarters of, of the uh, mathematicians assembled uh, raised their hands, declaring themselves to be Platonists. And, it, and it, you can name lots of other great, and a good example is uh, Alain Conn, uh, the, probably uh, one of the two or three top living French mathematicians, uh, has, is a flamboyantly Platonist. And so yes, the mathematical reality, it's much more real than the phenomenal world that we live in every day, which is, you know, precisely, uh, precisely Plato's view. Uh-huh. And, and by your account, his Platonism actually kind of in, informed, if, if, if not fueled, his kind of uh, quest, well, the, it, it helped energize his search for the incompleteness theorem in some sense, right? I, I mean, it was... Uh, well, well, go ahead. You, 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 I mean, I gather he, he, he wasn't happy with, well, go ahead. You tell the story. Uh, that's not entirely true. That it would be nice if that were true. Uh, and in fact, uh, when he was, you know, Gerbil was a very private and fastidious man. So it's difficult to tell what he was thinking at any point in his life. But as far as I can tell, in the, 19, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, when he was thinking about these matters, he was still a formalist. In this, and a formalist in, math, in the philosophy of mathematics is one who believes that mathematics is essentially a meaningless game. It's, a, right. it, and, and, um, it's the opposite of the platonic view. And that was the view that uh, David Hilbert, who was the greatest mathematician of the time, had espoused. And so Gödel was actually, we're getting into very esoteric matters now, we'll just do this very briefly, but, but Gödel may have been looking for uh, a sort of formalist vindication of Hilbert's view, and by some thought processes which he never really shared uh, with uh, anyone, he saw the possibility of refuting the formalist point of view and proving that there are truths of mathematics that will escape any given logical system. And so, in other words, mathematical truth, truth uh, transcends proof. And when this was first announced, no one really understand, uh, understood the import of Gödel's theorem. What could mathematical truth be if not, you know, exhibiting a proof of the proposition? And in what sense could a mathematical, an abstract mathematical proposition be true other than it's been proved. But to Gödel, it was true because it corresponded to this eternal, perfect mathematical reality that is independent of human consciousness. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a pretty heavy piece of metaphysical baggage. Yeah, okay, so let's make sure I, I get this. I, by the way, I'm an anti-Platonist. I, I think it's a lovely romance, but uh, alas, it's not true. And is formalism anti-Platonist? Did I understand that right? Formalism is yeah. an alternative to Platonism? Yeah, that's the most deflationary view of mathematics, that, uh, that it is, it's a game played with meaning, meaningless. Right. 
That's right, right. Exactly. That's so it's it's a, it's so in this view, mathematics is just like chess or something. It's a yeah. game you invented. It's internally consistent, but you could just as well have invented checkers. There's nothing like deeply significant about chess as opposed to checkers, right? I mean, to overstate maybe the degree to which they're minimizing the importance yeah. of math, but still, it's the idea is that it it is arbitrary in a way that it isn't according to the Platonists. Yeah, it's odd though that um, Georg Cantor, whom I write about in the book, and he was the creator of the theory of infinity in the um, late 19th century, he too was a Platonist, but he also stressed that the essence of mathematics is freedom. The freedom to imagine any kind of structure uh, and lay down the axioms for that structure and then using logic tease out the um, sort of uh, surprising uh, internal correspondences and, and, and properties and symmetries of the structure. Uh, so um, I would say that, uh, oddly enough, that you know, the, the platonic universe of mathematical reality that these mathematicians like Gödel, like Penrose, like Cantor believe in is, you know, it encompasses not only, it encompasses every possible abstract structure. So in a sense, the, the uh, mathematician has access to a far, far richer world than the physicist does because the physicist is confined to the structures that underlie the actual world. Mm -hmm. uh, the phys physicist, in a sense, is sort of a slave to actuality, whereas the mathematician can range freely over all, you know, the, all possible abstract structures. Right. Now, um... And, and, and that is one way of asking, I think, what we mean by the Platonism, right? The, is, which I would like to explore a little before we get back to incompleteness. Because to my mind, the, you know, when you say, well, they believe there's some kind of realm out there uh, where these truths exist, I'm like, uh, what the hell is that? Whereas it does seem to me, and I know, you know, you, 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 you come back to this Platonism question in a few of your essays, and in one of them, I know some physicist, or I, I think it's a physicist, says, well, that's crazy to think that they're out there in some realm, because if they are, then how could the mind magically make contact with them? The, mind, the brain is a physical thing. How could it make contact with them if they're in this immaterial world? But I'm wondering if there's a less exotic way to phrase Platonism. In, in other words, isn't it just, in some sense, significant that as it happens, mathematics does often correspond to the workings of the physical world in a fruitful way. Isn't that, isn't that a kind of endorsement of, of mathematics? The fact that it is the language that lets us manipulate the physical world with ever more amazing dexterity, witness modern technology, right? There are different points of views on that. Uh, you may have heard of uh, the great Cambridge, uh, the English mathematician G.H. Hardy, uh, who was played actually by Jeremy Irons in the uh, recent film about uh, the, the mathematician Ramanujan. I forget what the uh, title, you know what the title of that was by any chance? I forget. The film that came out about a year and a half ago. Uh, yeah. Anyway, G.H. Uh, uh, Hardy, who was the, the Dean of English Mathematicians in the early 20th century, uh, he reveled in the presumed uselessness of mathematics. It was like, you know, Oscar Wilde saying all, all art is completely useless. Hardy said that, you know, true, the, the sort of mathematics he was interested in was completely useless, and the sort of mathematics that was useful he considered to be very ugly. And he actually pointed to the, um, the sort of mathematics that's used in, uh, uh, in warfare to uh, calculate, you know, how, where missiles will fall and, and that sort of thing as being exceptionally ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, whereas Penrose, right, Sir Roger Penrose, believes that the part of mathematics that applies to the physical world is the most beautiful part of mathematics. So that, that may come down to a matter of, of different So somebody who, who was, uh, wanted to counter what I just suggested would say, well, sure, math sometimes corresponds to the physical world, but often it doesn't. It, it's, it's, uh, yeah, most of mathematics has no, I mean, yes, some of the abstract structures of mathematics are uh, sort of mirrored in, in the physical world or echoed by the physical world or isomorphic, to, to use the technical term, to structures in the physical world. Um, most of it is, it is not. Mm. Uh, and um, there's, you know, an interesting recent development. Uh, you, you know about string theory. String theory, 
uh, uh, arose in the 60s and 70s. And, 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 you, and you have a good essay on that in the book, we should say. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of, a, it, you know, it seems to be a, a, a failed paradigm, but physicists are, uh, are so invested in it that they're very reluctant to let it go. It's never really paid off in any dividends in explaining the world. It's not even a theory. It's simply a, a, a bunch of mathematical arguments that a theory exists, no testable predictions. Uh, yet it's been tremendously uh, fruitful in pure mathematics, which is an, an irony that now you have a, a you know, a, a proposed physical theory that's not working. Uh, instead of it being inspired by mathematics, it's inspiring a lot of pure mathematics itself. And the figure of Edward Witten, one of your neighbors mm -hmm. in Princeton, mm -hmm. uh, who's a physicist, he was actually awarded the uh, Fields Medal, which is the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, essentially, in the 1990s for work he did in pure mathematics, and he's considered to be the dean of string theorists. So the, the relationship between mathematics and physics has, uh, has become uh, you know, more of a two-way street recently. That's a rather banal observation to make, but that didn't stop me. Uh, I can't believe I used the metaphor of a two-way street. How insipid. Oh, I've seen worse, I've seen worse. Yeah, yeah. You've <laughs> I've committed worse. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, that's the way to talk to your generous host. Yeah, uh, 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 fear of the cliche is a sign of a second-rate mind. So we, I quite, we quite so. Cliche. Whoever said that is uh, first-rate. Yeah, e Evelyn Waugh said that. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, so wait, where were we? Uh, so uh, the, on this... So do I have it wrong about Gerdel then? I, I, apparently I do, but it, it's such a great story that I want to repeat it. <laughs> that uh, he was motivated, like, like these mathematicians who were like uh, saying it's just like an internally consistent game uh, that ma mathematics is. It, it's wrong to say that he, in order to show that they were in it, that, 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 that the incompleteness theorem was aimed at, among other things, showing that they were in error in some sense. That's wrong. That's probably wrong historically. It's a nice it story. Could that's be a story right, that but it's not. I'm sorry? It could be right, but it's not. Uh, it's probably not right. Yeah. Um, but the, 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 uh, Gödel's di views did see, but when, by the time he was in his 30s, he was, he was a, a convinced Platonist who believed in mathematical reality and actually talked about having a sort of extrasensory perception of, uh, of mathematical objects. Uh, so he, he, meant, he meant his blatant in that. How we may, how, you know, what, what's the physical, as you pointed out, we think with our brains, which are physical objects, how do we make this connection? Sir Roger Penrose uh, is equally um, coy and evasive when you ask him how uh, the mathematician has knowledge of mathematical reality if it transcends the physical spatio-temporal world, and he talks about consciousness somehow breaking through to it, and you know, in rather uh, mystical terms, I would say. Well, it's funny. I ask his collaborator Hameroff, is, is Penrose? Is this like a religious thing for Penrose? Because you know, it gets back to Plato's conception. You know, his like metaphor of the cave, and like the things we see in this world are mere uh, kind of uh, refractions of these more ideal and perfect forms that are out there. And the realm that they occupied, I gather, Plato thought of as kind of a divine realm. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I had thought of it as having these kind of vaguely religious or mystical overtones. And what Hameroff said is, basically, he doesn't like to talk about it. He doesn't like to kind of answer that question, which leads me to suspect that the answer is, is yes, that it is almost a religious thing with him. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know how much we want to talk about Roger Penrose's views, but um, one, I think, you know, very interesting idea that he has is that there are essentially three, ontologically, there are three distinct worlds. There is the physical world described by physics and the other, in the special sciences. There's the world of consciousness, and there's the platonic mathematical world. And the platonic mathematical world, Penrose, is so, it sort of exists by logical necessity, and it's so rich and beautiful, it sort of spills over into creating the physical world. And so, and, and, and for Penrose, it's the best and most beautiful part of the platonic mathematical world that gives rise to the physical world. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, so now you've got the, the platonic mathematical world giving rise or generating somehow the physical world. I, and then the physical world, the really 
most beautiful best bits of that are the brain, the human brain that's probably the most complicated and highly organized structure that we know of in the cosmos. And um, so the, the, the best part of the physical world, human brains, actually the brains of mathematicians, um, uh, they, they, they become conscious and uh, now you have the platonic mathematical world giving rise to the physical world, which gives rise to the world of consciousness. And the conscious brains of the mathematicians then break through the, to the platonic world. So now you have the triangle is complete. The platonic mathematical world gives rise to the physical world, which gives rise to the world of consciousness, which somehow breaks through to the platonic world again, or even engenders it. And so you've got these three worlds all kind of holding one another up over the abyss of nothingness. It's a very pretty image. Uh, you know, it, if, it would require me uh, to take about four bong hits to take it seriously, but it's, it's pretty. It is pretty. I don't know how you'd arrive at that conclusion exactly. You'd have to have a mind different from mine. Um, it, it just seems uh, so exotic. But, but, but you've answered my question. I mean, when these people are serious, when they, they, when they you know, the, the, this question of Platonism, it, it, it's a real unusual belief. That, yeah, uh, there's mathematicians, by the way, I think that the, um, when, to, uh, uh, you know, Penrose, one of, one of the great mathematical minds of the late 20th century, uh, and to mathematicians of that uh, cognitive you know, power, they are seeing um, all kinds of uncovenanted richness in math, these strange relations between distant parts of the mathematical universe that, you know, we didn't put them there. You know, we, we, don't, we think we invent mathematical structures over here, we invent them over here, and then suddenly we discover that there are these subtle interrelationships that we never dreamed could exist. And so it really does seem to, you know, this mathematical reality is really robust and sort of kicks back at you and it surprises you. So when you're involved in it at a level of, of, uh, of, uh, of profundity, like Penrose and the others, it does really seem genuinely real and much more real than the, you know, than the physical world. Now, I assume if you believe math exists in a platonic realm, then you believe that logic itself does, right? Because math is basically employing logic uh, after having established premises, right? And, and yeah. so, so and, and I mean, let me try to put, do one more like non-exotic mystical renderings of what it seems to me a person could kind of mean by the Platonism is just that like you could say that as a as like an empirical matter, any any species that evolved and managed to manipulate the world technologically the way we have would have had to take logic seriously, take formal logic seriously. And in that sense, it was kind of out there. In other words, any any evolving intellectual system is either going to happen upon it or stop evolving in a sense. Does that make um, sense? Yes. Uh, I don't believe that. I think that the, that logic is, you know, it's like a set of uh, accounting conventions. It doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have any transcendental uh, element to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I take a similarly def def deflationary view of mathematics. I think that, uh, our, law, our knowledge of mathematics is uh, not knowledge of a transcendent realm. It's merely uh, knowledge of logical implications, which, which you know, are essentially conventional. Um, and uh, this is called if-thenism. You can, you can you know, come up with some axioms that describe a certain abstract structure, like the, like the axioms that describe what are called groups in abstract algebra, uh, and then you can look at the logical implications. And by logical impl implications, we simply mean the propositions that follow by a set of, uh, of you know, of conventional rules uh, that don't lead to um, inconsistency. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we know that if these axioms are true of something, then these consequences are also true of that thing. And that's it. Now, whether there are structures out there in the world that of you know that are described by these axioms or not is another matter. If there are, then that part of mathematics is going to have applications in the world, and it's going to be useful. Uh, there, there, the, the, 
you also seem to raise the question of whether mathematics is necessary to science and technology. And uh, it seems to be certainly for humans because uh, of our limited uh, cognitive powers. But a, a friend of mine uh, who's a philosopher of mathematics and logic named Hartree Field at uh, New York University wrote a book uh, about 20 years ago called Science Without Number. And what he showed was that the need to refer to abstract mathematical entities to make science work uh, was, um, uh, was, not, was, was a contingent need. In other words, you could do all of science without positing any uh, purely mathematical entities like numbers. Uh, and so it, it seems like it would be a pretty laborious enterprise if you did it that way. <laughs> it, was a, it was, a, it was, yes, it is laborious. It, you know, the uh, mathematics gives you lots of shortcuts for driving uh, implications of physical theory. But so uh, the, my point is that to a mind, you know, to a transhuman mind of sufficient power, math right. would not be necessary. It's and the and, and the beauty of mathematics to them would be like the, the beauty of tic tac toe to a small child, right? Right. Um, it would look like you know, as, as Bertrand Russell, the philosopher, said, you know, when he was a young man, he thought that mathematics, mathematical beauty, was the, the, the you know the greatest, most pure thing ever, and that's when he really uh, transcended his finite, lousy, contingent humanity and made touch with the eternal. As an old man, he came to reject that point of view as, as romantic and wrongheaded. And he said, to a mind of sufficient intelligence, mathematics uh, would be no more interesting like a tautology, like, like a, you know, a, a brown cow is a cow. Um, and I kind of like that deflationary view of mathematics because I, I don't like positing a lot of transcendent realities. I'm, you know, having mm -hmm. difficulty with the everyday reality. Well, you can be there. pretty impressed by mathematics without considering it quite transcendent. But, but well, anyway, let, let me, uh, so let's, let's at least do a crisp uh, take on the, the, uh, the incompleteness theorem itself. There are actually two of them, I gather. Uh, w one way you one thing you said, which I think is not the way you say it in the uh, essay, but when you said uh, any any system, well, I don't know if any system must have uh, things that are true but unprovable, but certainly it can be the case that there are things that are true but unprovable. Is that one of the consequences of the incompleteness theorem? Um, we have to be careful here. There are some mathematical systems that are complete, like the, okay. the, the, uh, the axiomatization of, of geometry is complete in that every geometric truth can be derived from a finite set of axioms. The, uh, I don't want to get too technical here, but the, the um, axioms of the uh, real number system are complete. Uh, what Gödel pro proved was that any uh, axiomatic system that encompasses the numbers, arithmetic, uh, is incomplete, and that's because you can make numbers and 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 formulas uh, and uh, about numbers essentially talk about themselves under an interpretation. So, right. uh, and so any any well, any, that was his method of proving yeah. the incompleteness theorem, right? The, the self-reference, yeah. the 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 creative deployment of the language of math itself to make statements about math. Is that what he did? Yeah, it's sort of like a good uh, comparison is. Um, if you uh, write a play in which the characters are seemingly talking among themselves in a way that develops the plot, but under another interpretation, they're also talking about the very play that they're in. And right. that, so, so um, yeah, it's uh, formulas. So it's kind of postmodern. Maybe we should say this was the beginning of postmodernism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's not make trite observations like that. <laughs> no, cliches are great. Yeah. If cliches are, I, I'm yeah. I, I'm I'm in favor of this. I'm I'm yes. I, I, I'm. I want this to be my my claim. If no one's made it, that I thought that postmodernism had been superseded, but um, oh, okay, <laughs> maybe not in principle. So, so anyway, so he uses this very kind of clever self-referential way, or he turns a language into a meta language or something. But anyway, he does this very clever. Uh, thing and so one of the takeaways though is that like you can't say for sure that there aren't things that are true that are not provable wait that's just too many negatives you tell me what did what did what did he say what what is the incompleteness theorem the incompleteness theorem there are two incompleteness theorems the first one says that in any 
logical system that can uh, uh, e express arithmetic. There, where there will be propositions that are true but can't be proved in that system. Uh, the second theorem says that uh, in any mathematical system that encompasses arithmetic, uh, it's impossible to prove that that system is consistent, uh, meaning that it's impossible to prove that, that the system doesn't harbor a contradiction. And contradictions, of course, are fatal in mathematics because if you could drive a contradiction mm -hmm. from a mathematical theory, then you can drive absolutely everything and the distinction between truth and falsehood collapses. By the way, there, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, there was a very great mathematician named Vavoidsky who died under somewhat mysterious circumstances about two years ago, I believe in his late 40s. And he believed that one of the implications of the second Gödel incompleteness theorem that says that, math that mathematics can't prove its own consistency, that this was really uh, dangerous and scary because mathematics might be like a computer program, a very complicated computer program that has a bug in it. Now, a computer program, as we all know, all the software these days is buggy. I mean, it used to be in the early days when I was a programmer, you would, you would debug a program completely, so it was a consistent logical structure. Now the programs are so complicated that they all have bugs, and they work for a while perfectly well, and then because of the bug, they'll crash. And so he thought maybe mathematics, maybe the implication of what Gödel showed, Bovoitsky believed, this great mathematician who won the Fields Medal, one of the greatest uh, mm -hmm. uh, mathematicians of our day, he worried that mathematics might harbor a contradiction and therefore, in effect, it has a bug in it. Uh, and this could be disastrous because it could invalidate all of the mathematical theories that have been developed laboriously over the centuries. And so he wanted to put mathematics on a new foundation so that even if a contradiction or a bug emerged, as Gödel showed, was always possible, that it would still be useful. This is called uh, type homotopy theory, and it's very, very esoteric, esoteric stuff. Uh, and so even though what we're talking about seems you know, impossibly removed from any you know, uh, practical aspect of existence, uh, there are those who, who think of it as being you know, as, as being kind of like an intellectual neutron bomb. Yeah. Well, that's good because I was, I mean, good that you said, because I was about to ask, like, everyone says this was earth shaking, but in what sense was it earth shaking? I mean, people, when they finally grasp its implications, the incompleteness theorem, they said, oh, wait, now blank. Now what? Now, now what's no longer reliable or true or, or you know, as a practical matter, kind of. Yeah. And this guy, you're saying, was saying, well, all of mathematics could be shot, right? Yeah, the, well, the, uh, the hope of the mathematical community was expressed by David Hilbert. He said, in mathematics, there is no ignoramibus. Uh, in other words, we don't know. You could, any mathematical problem that can be expressed can be resolved as either true or false. Mm -hmm. Gödel seemed to show that this, this, this wasn't possible. And so, as I, you know, the... the, the proposition that Gödel constructed said, I am not provable, in effect. And so if it's true, there's no proof for it uh, by its very, you know, it's a very complicated proposition involving actually very large numbers. Uh, and uh, so this was, this was shocking because proof and truth were thought to be the same thing in mathematics. Uh, eventually, though, mathematicians Seem, it came to care less about it because they said, wait a minute, this Gödel proposition that says I'm not provable, it's a really kind of kinky, weird proposition. It doesn't look like any kind of natu you know, natural mathematical proposition, like say like Fermat's last theorem, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, I won't go into that, but everyone knows what Fermat's last theorem is, that, that the equation A to the N plus B to the N equals C to the N doesn't have any uh, non-trivial solutions for n greater than which was two. finally proved by another Princeton resident, correct? Yes, yes, it's all happening Andrew in Princeton. Andrew Wiles. Andrew Wiles proved it uh, in the 1990s, uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, but eventually mathematicians started finding uh, interesting mathematical uh, uh, propositions that were undecidable in Gödel's sense, and so uh, mm -hmm. it seemed to have a you know a, a little more. Uh, of a, of a uh, uh, kind of a, a bearing on what they did on a day-to-day -day basis. And whenever there's a, you know, a, a 
mathematical. But anyway, we don't have to talk about mathematics forever because that's only a, a small part of the book. Uh, but right, right. I know. We, we, we're, gonna, I, we're about to switch to Einstein. Let me, let me just yeah, yeah. ask in summary. So, so he showed that math A is not, you could say, comprehensive in the sense that there could be things that are true that it can't prove. So it's not comprehensive. Uh, even uh, even true things. I don't mean true things like uh, you know like uh, you know that's a beautiful tree, but true things that are mathematical truths but cannot be proved, right? Mm -hmm. And and B, uh, it can't guarantee its own internal consistency. Right. Good. So, Good so, so neither if you were assuming it was comprehensive uh, and internally consistent, you are over two is what he showed. Very good. Great. So um, a really punchy formulation. I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> You can write a book called that if you want. Okay. As far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm a generous man. So Einstein, quickly, you know, uh, but Richard Feynman, in his book, uh, The Character of Physical Law, I think, said, you know, there was, there was uh, a time, people used to say, no one understands relativity. That's not true. There was always at least somebody who understood relativity. But no one understands quantum physics. This is what Feynman said. Now, uh, I don't understand relativity. I'm, uh, that's not shocking. Many people don't. Wait a minute. When you say relativity, there, 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 there are two kinds of relativity. There's the special theory, which yeah. Einstein came up with in 1905, yeah. and the general theory, which he came up with in 1915. Everyone can understand the special theory. It's just linear algebra. And uh, you know, all undergraduates should, should learn the, the special theory of relativity. The general theory of relativity, which encompasses gravity, uh, is much, much harder because it's based on differential geometry. And, and that is, I mean, it, yeah, but I, see, I have trouble beginning with the thought experiments. Leave aside the math that's required. Yeah. No, the thought experiments are genuinely confusing. And indeed, Feynman himself, you know, there's a famous thought experiment uh, called the twin paradox in special relativity. Uh -huh. Two identical twins. One of them gets on a rocket ship and goes off at a very high speed, close to the speed of light, relative to the twin back on Earth. Right. Uh, Smith comes back and is much younger than his identical twin. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the implications of special relativity. Um, uh, Einstein, uh, uh, Feynman himself, in the explanation he gives for the twin paradox in his lectures on um, physics, which was the undergraduate course he taught, taught, taught at uh, Caltech, is uh, incorrect. So um, the... Uh, Mastering the mathematics of relativity is one thing, but kind of understanding its deeper meaning is right. The conceptualization of it is problematic. Like, so for example, this business of the twin paradox, you know, the Planet of the Apes thing, right, where they 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 leave the planet at high velocity and then they come back and time has been moving faster on on yeah, planet yeah. Earth. The the uh, so in your book, you you I think I think this is a thought experiment that. Yeah, they, you know, the that, that, that experiment has, has been done with, you know, two atomic clocks. I know. They've actually done the experiment. It's mind-blowing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no question that that's correct, yeah. Right. But, but when you – so you start us off – I think this is a, a thought experiment you're describing that's leading us in this direction. And it starts off with, um, okay, so you are – say you're, you're watching a light beam go by at 100 miles an hour, and you see someone kind of – traveling in the same direction, but at only 60 miles an hour. So mm -hmm. to, to you, the light seems to be moving 40 miles per hour faster than that person. And yet, from the person's point of view who is in the light beam moving in its direction, they look at how fast the light is moving beyond them, and to them it looks like 100 miles per hour. Now, you say that Einstein just kind of asserted that on the basis of what we know about electromagnetic waves, but it's like, why would you assert that? That's crazy. How that, that, that does not comport with our conception of velocity. <laughs> um, okay. Einstein thought that physical laws should be true for all observers. Right. Uh, and uh, if I'm moving, suppose, forget about, you know, dr driving in a car, or supposing we're out in empty space. Yeah. And I'm, dr you, you see yourself as being still and you see me, you know, drifting away from you at 60 miles an hour. And I see myself as being uh, in the same position and seeing you drifting away from me at 60 miles an hour. Who's so the same who's right? Moving, right? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, and, and the, the physical laws for both of us should be the same. And among the physical laws are the laws of electromagnetism. And from the laws of electromagnetism, you can deduce the speed of light. Now, uh, so the speed of light should be ex the same for me and the same for you, even though we're in relative motion. Okay. Okay. So if I say to, to and so, so something, if so, if we both me measure the speed of light as being the same, uh, th th that we're we're going to disagree on other things, such as uh, simultaneity. I mean, this right. it requires a couple of layers of deduction. Uh, I'm going to see your clocks is running a little too slow, and your rulers being shorter than you think they are, and you'll see the same as being true of my clocks and my rulers. And everything comes out nicely. We both measure the speed of light the same. So that's that's an absolute thing. And simultaneity and the rate at which clocks run and the length of rulers are, are not absolute things. They're relative to perspective. Right. So I did was when he says things like this, you know, like or, or when he says like, uh, okay, uh, two people are. Uh, I mean, I'm just making this up. Suppose there's a train here and there's a person on each side of the train and then the clock is way over here. So they're both equally distant from the train, but one is further from the clock. And so when they, when they talk about, uh, you know, when the train arrived, for one of them it seems later because the light, it took the light longer to get to them from the clock, even though they're equally distant from the train, okay? Will you accept that premise? I don't think Einstein ever said that. But, but, but he, what he would say, it's the kind of thing he would say. And what I would say is, well, that's just because one of them is closer to the clock. I mean, why not? Why don't we stick with the intuitive idea that, okay, but from a kind of a God's eye point of view, there's just this one universal clock. And if you account for the speed of, and if you just treat the, uh, the speed of lo how long it's taking individual people to see the readout from the clock as just a kind of a, an arbitrary you know, aberration, or just a, a, a distortion of perception. It's like, why, I just don't understand why he ever started taking these individual perspectives seriously, I guess. Um, okay. Uh, consider again, different observers who are all moving uh, at uh, uniformly with respect to each other. Each mm -hmm. observer thinks he's the one who's standing still and the other observers are moving. Right. So they, they all occupy different frames of reference. Um, they're all going to, it's, it's very easy to drive from that, that they're all going to have a different notion of what events are simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So they're going to differ on, you know, on what's going on now in different parts of space. Uh, that's a very, uh, that, and then you can say, okay, one of them is really, so that they're, and their clocks are all relative to one another running at different speeds, it seems. Right. Now you're saying there's one universal clock. How do we know which of them is the universal clock? You, we, sure, we can say uh, Jones well, over there. You can, define, really... you can define ground zero as the center of the universe and say, okay, that's the actual, that clock is the real clock. I mean, you could- oh, you okay, can so, yeah, there, there are ways. Yeah, you can define an observer at rest with respect to the average mass of the observable universe. You can do that, sure. Uh, right, and just posit that. I just look. Yeah, but, he must have been right because it turns out that on the basis of his of his theories, you can actually manipulate the physical world in certain ways, and certain predictions come true. And that's all fine. It just it's just it still seems to me like a crazy tangent for him to have gone off on to begin yeah, with. It, 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 you know, it's the it, the problem is that Newton's laws of motion are wrong because they treat time and space asymmetrically, uh, and that's what Einstein fixed, uh, and that's uh, he did it a priori. You know, there's the famous uh, Michelson-Morley experiment that showed that you know everyone thought that light waves were propagated through what they call the luminous, luminiferous ether, and uh, you know, it's, if they're waves, they mu there must be something waving like the water, uh, mm -hmm. and so the, the whole universe must be fused, must be filled with this ether and the light waves are being propagated through the ether. And then, so the question is, how, is the earth, at what speed is the earth traveling through this e ether? It, it must, it, it, it can't be uh, uh, at, at rest in the ether because it's going in a circle. So at one point it's, you know, it's moving one way in the ether or the other point is moving the other way. And so Michelson Morley in the late 19th century tried to measure the speed of the earth through the, the, the ether. 
and they discovered that no matter which way the earth was moving, uh, they were getting exactly the same results. So, uh, so you know, the, what Einstein realized is there is no ether. Uh, you know, this was a bit of unobservable stuff, physical stuff that played no role in the theory. And, and he stripped it away and found the simple essence behind this. And uh, so, I mean, we can't reproduce all of the theory of special relativity in five minutes, but it, uh, it's, it's well, every, every college student should learn it. Uh, general relativity, much, much harder. Let me take one more stab about why this is baffling to me. Stab at why this is baffling to me. So, yeah. so, so like, okay, I'm traveling in the direction of the light beam and it's going 100 miles per hour, and I'm going 40 or 60, and Einstein posits that, to me, if I measure the, the, the velocity of the light, it will still seem like it's going 100 relative to me, even though common sense would seem to indicate otherwise. I, I'm just wondering, like, he wouldn't say that if it were the wind, right? If the wind were going at 100 miles per hour and I was moving at 60, he would say, from my perspective, the wind is going at 40 miles per hour. And so I'm wondering, why does he think light is different? And I guess it's because the, the, you would say the velocity of the wind is not a physical law. Light is a physical law. Is that, is that it? Or is there just something super special about light? Because there's certainly, it, is, it assumes this very, light assumes this almost yeah. mystically important, unique role in his theories. It's like the limit yeah. on how fast we can transmit information and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, light, light is actually, the, the speed of light is the exchange rate between uh, between distance and time, between space and time, essentially? Well, and the conversion it, it figures in the conversion factor between energy and mass too. That's true. Yeah, it's also yes, right. It's also the exchange rate between en energy and mass. Um, uh, the um, which is just super weird to me. Like, why does this one physical phenomenon? I mean, that must say something about the structure of the universe that. Maybe everyone else gets what it says, and I just don't get it because I don't even understand. Okay. The oddly enough, you don't even know how you don't even have to know about electromagnetic theory and light to arrive at relativity. Uh, th th this is uh, my, this is something that I came up with. If I'm moving in, at a uniform rate relative to you, we're out in space and we see ourselves as drifting apart, right? Uh, each of us thinks that we're stationary and the other guy is moving. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what we call here is also moving apart. I'm here and you're there, 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 there. Whereas you're here and I'm there, 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 there. So our sense of what, you know, when we're passing, here mm -hmm. is the same for us. But then it starts changing. Um, if time is like space, then, if we're in, then the same thing should be true of now. If I'm moving relative to you, what we call now, should be drifting apart, and what events we say are simultaneous should also dri be drifting apart. Mm -hmm. From that simple symmetry between space and time, you can derive all the special relativity, the so-called Lorentz transformations, which everybody who's taken an undergraduate course in physics uh, knows about. They're extremely beautiful. Um, you can derive those, and you and you can sort of uh, you know you can prove a priori that the world has to be uh, such that there's some universal exchange rate between space and time, uh, call it C. And then when you discover electromagnetic theory, you say, oh, well, C happens to be the speed of light. So light must play a really essential uh, role in the fabric of reality. Um, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that a lot of this can be derived a priori. We think of it as, uh, as something that was um, uh, sort of forced upon us by weird experimental results. No, it's the way nature should be if it was constructed by, you know, a decent intelligence. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, God, you know, Einstein had a kind of uh, a Spinozaistic uh, view of God. He, uh, he thought that, you know, uh, God, you know, Spinoza, the God alias nature, it was the same right. Kind of a pantheon. Did he really? Did he really kind of believe that, or was it just his way of preserving God talk so he wouldn't be called a godless atheist, even though he had a fundamentally scientific worldview? I mean, the thing about pantheism. Same question, of Spinoza, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is a good question. I mean, because pantheism to me has always just seemed like using the word God for the word universe, or using the word God for the word nature. It it doesn't. I don't. I don't see it as like a in a certain sense a genuinely religious belief. Like I would but almost. In the case of Einstein, though, it. It, it, there was an element in faith to it because he had a 
deep and abiding conviction that the universe was uh, operated along rational, intelligible lines. Mm -hmm. This is why he was so offended by uh, quantum mechanics when it was discovered. And he, of course, had a role in the discovery of quantum mechanics. That's what he won the Nobel Prize for. Uh, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that quantum mechanics uh, is indeterministic. You know, he, Einstein famously said, I refuse to believe that God placed dice with the universe. So everyone thinks that what bothered him about quantum mechanics is that it's indeterministic. It has an element of randomness. Mm -hmm. You can only derive probabilities, not precise outcomes. That's not what bothered Einstein. Einstein was bothered by the idea that quantum, uh, of quantum entanglement, uh, the idea that, that uh, uh, two particles on opposite sides of the uh, cosmos could be in this kind of weird communication. So if you... So they can, there can be influence that is exerted over distance instantaneously. Instantaneously, which of course makes no sense from the point of view of relativity theory. So Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. And he said, you know, this can't possibly uh, uh, exist because it would make science impossible. You can't do an experiment if everything in the universe can instantaneously influence what's going on in your lab. You can't, as it were, observe an isolated system and do experiments. So Einstein thought that you know the very possibility of science uh, uh, presupposed that there could be no quantum entanglement, no spooky action at a distance, and that's why he objected to quantum mechanics. And as it turned out, tragically, Einstein was wrong, and nature is less sane than he thought it should be. There is spooky action at a distance. This was has been proved in experiments that. Uh, that uh, tested what's called Bell's inequality, but this is another kettle of fish we're getting into. Yeah. No, it's weird. One more thing on Einstein and... Einstein was a deep philosopher, by the way. I, Einstein had a, a really, you know, um, a, had an ability to see philosophical issues with crystal clarity and to, you know, penetrate to the uh, real heart of them that, you know, put him well, ahead... he was also a very clear writer. Yes. He and, you know, I, I find, I, I, I really think that the best, I mean, scientists can become famous for various reasons. They can um, just stumble upon data. I mean, for example, uh, um, I'm actually sitting in the house that was owned by the person who was actually looking for the background uh, radiation uh, from the Big Bang, when these guys who had no idea what they were looking for, didn't even know it when they saw it, stumbled upon it via satellite dish. They yeah, won the Nobel Prize. It, it was bird guano on their, uh, on their dish. They did. Uh, and they won the Nobel Prize, even though the occupants of this house actually authored the big paper because he had to explain to them what they had found. They, they co-authored the paper in Nature. But anyway, they won the Nobel Prize. My point is, scientists can become famous for a lot of reasons, but... Um, I, I find that really the great scientists, I think they tend to be really clear writers and, as you say, deep, deep thinkers. I mean, uh, I think Richard Feynman is another very clear writer uh, and, and deep, I think I would say deep philosophical thinker. Yeah, even though he always made fun of philosophers. He thought, you know, the philosophers were, you know, he, he, he had in mind cocktail party philosophers who said, you know, of course, uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, let's see. Well, I'm trying to think of a good example. Oh, never mind. I, it's it's just flown my mind. Yeah, but yeah. well, maybe because but the Feynman, Feynman, Feynman pretended that he was a kind of you know a, a rube who was just really good at calculating. But in fact, yeah, he did have this ability to think about you know the possibility for 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 uh, instance of backward causation and to yeah. think about you know what we have uh, an electron and a positron and the positron is the antiparticle of an electron. Uh, and Feynman said, wait a minute, what if a positron is just an electron moving backwards in time? You know, what if, that's a really profound insight. And what if, it, you know, Did it why is it... Did it turn out all... to be the case? I'm sorry? Did it turn out, was he vindicated? Did uh, people... you, you, he worked out a mathematical theory uh, in which it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an open question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's a, it's a consistent view of uh, particles and antiparticles. For example, I mean, he was always talking about backwards causation. He had a, uh, a theory with John Archibald Wheeler, who you may know of, who was the um, uh, mm -hmm. great his teacher and the coiner of the term black hole and so forth, uh, involving uh, uh, radiation propagating into the past as well as into the future uh, mm -hmm. and uh, really, really deep stuff. 
So speaking of time, a couple of things. We're running out of it, A, and B, I want to, I though, first touch on Einstein's conception of time a little more. Now, um, so I gather that, uh, you know, one thing you say in the book is he, he, believe, he argued or showed or believed or something that time is, in a sense, a fiction, in some sense of fiction, in some oh. sense is not real, as it's sometimes put. Now, <clears throat> I gather that, on the one hand, this was kind of a conclusion that followed from these uh, counterintuitive thought experiments that we've been describing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the conclusion itself can be phrased in a way that I, that I actually understand oddly. In other words, uh, it can be stated. Uh, I mean, in other words, if you, if you view, I gather he would view time, it's really just another dimension. And in principle, you could move along it as you can move uh, along a spatial dimension, uh, you could move into the, uh, the future, the, whoops, let me just give it that. Um, but, uh, well, let me just cut to the chase. It seems to me he's basically just describing a deterministic universe. It gets back to the fact that he believed God doesn't play dice. Um, but, uh, right, I mean, and, and that I understand. If what you mean is that the future is inevitable, so time is just, you're just kind of walking along it the way you walk along uh, a, a spatial dimension. To me, that's not that exotic a claim. It may not be true, but at least I understand it. Is, yeah. is that well, I mean, the, the, the most um, striking thing about time in our day-to-day -day experience is, is the sense that it flows. I mean, we, it's been flowing while we've been talking. You can't stay still in time the way you seem to be able to stand still in space. Right. So that's one thing about time. Uh, uh, the, another is that there's something special about the present moment, uh, that, that the present moment is somehow more real than the past and the future. And maybe the, the future isn't quite as real as the past because the past has already happened. The future is still in some sense open. And the idea that time has a direction, uh, that, uh, that the, the, the uh, past is importantly different from the future. These are all intuitive uh, components of uh, time. And, and in physics, there's, you, know, there, you can't find anything that corresponds to the flow of time. Uh, and there's nothing special about the present moment. And you know, Einstein showed that what's present for me, um, for instance, if I'm um, uh, walking up Fifth Avenue, then on a planet in the star system, Alpha Centauri, uh, what's happened on Tuesday is now for me. And if you're walking in the opposite direction on Fifth Avenue for me, then what's happening on Thursday on the planet in Alpha Centauri is now for you. So which is really now? Um, the, the, uh, so the, the, the whole idea that there's this kind of, you know, moving spotlight that called now that illuminates reality and, and moves into the future goes by the boards. Um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the, so Einstein concluded that, you know, the right way of viewing physical reality is it's a block universe. It's going to, you know, uh, all times, in a sense, coexist timelessly. And over there, you're being born. And over there, you're going to college. And over there, you're dead. And over there, you're forgotten. Uh, and they're all equally real. And so when he, you know, he uh, uh, consoled the, the sister of his best friend, uh, Michele Besso, when, when uh, Besso died, saying, you know, time is just a persistently sovereign illusion. Um, and uh, I, it, I don't think he could bring himself to believe this because the flow of time uh, and the sense that we're being, you know, pushed into the future willy-nilly is the strongest, you know, the, the, the most distinctive experience we have uh, as humans living in the world. Right. Uh, but but Ed Gödel too was a, a disbelief in the reality of time. And can I just mention the the surprise birthday gift on uh, uh, Einstein's seventieth birthday mm. in nineteen fifty? I forget what it, it must have been fifty two, fifty one. Uh, he uh, Gödel came up with a solution to Einstein's field equations of general relativity, uh, in which which is very hard to do mathematically. Uh, Einstein couldn't do it in which the universe was rotating as a whole, and there were what he called, uh, what are called closed time-like loops. So in other words, in one of these closed time-like loops, you could travel around the universe and then travel back into your own past. And so Gödel concluded that in such a universe, time is not real because time that, is pa that, you know, that hasn't passed, that can be re revisited, isn't really time at all. Uh, 
uh, and uh, and if time doesn't exist in this possible universe, it doesn't exist in any universe because time e is either necessary or it doesn't exist at all. Now there's several bad inferences in uh, Gödel's reasoning, but when he presented Einstein with this you know, completely unexpected solution to Einstein's equations. Einstein was really not best pleased by it because, you know, once again, the, the equations of general relativity, you know, so uh, beautiful and so powerful seem to imply kind of crazy possibilities. And, you know, Einstein didn't like the idea of a black hole either. Uh, he didn't like the idea of an expanding universe uh, as, as right. you um, So, yeah, that, that, you know, go, again, goes to Einstein's kind of a priori sense that the world has to be rational. He was almost a Hegelian in that sense. The real is rational. Um, well, it... Walked you into a condition of a coma. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm just thinking. I mean, it is pretty rational. I'm also... I was also thinking, I mean, on this business of the block universe, you know, with time just being another dimension, I mean, it seems like it would in principle be possible to build creatures, maybe not biological creatures on this planet, but if you were just starting the universe from scratch and, and it had the basic laws it has, couldn't you in theory build a creature <clears throat> for whom time seemed the way space seems to us and space seemed the way time seems to us? In other words, I mean, if he's right and time is really not fundamentally different from space, then, then it's just kind of an illusion of our perceptual apparatus that time is this undetermined thing that keeps coming at us uh, and, and in principle, we could have been built the other way and we could see the future. We could see the past the way I see East yeah. and West, but then East would be this thing that seems to be coming at me. That's possible. In right. it, it is possible. Uh, and in fact, you may have heard of uh, hypothesized particles called tachyons that, that move faster than the speed of light. Uh, yeah. and, they, and it, they couldn't be used to send signals because that would lead to, uh, to paradoxes. But if there, there could be on the other side of the speed of light, a whole world of particles with which we don't interact that move faster than the speed of light and for, for which effectively time and space would be transposed. So space would behave like time and time would behave right. like space. Right. In other words, you know, you can stand, you could be born and live your entire life in the same house and die without ever moving around. So you in so in space you would be completely still, and in time you would move along for a period. Right. A tachyon that moves infinitely fast would only exist at a moment, but it would be everywhere at that moment. So it would be you know it would be the diametrical opposite. It would experience time and space in an opposite way. Now physicists don't take tachyon seriously uh, because they have all kinds of paradoxical properties. But, you know, one of my guiding axioms is that reality is all, always richer than we imagine it to be. And so mm -hmm. I think it's quite plausible that on the other side of the speed of light, there are, there's a rich world of tachyonic particles that, are, uh, inter that, that interact with themselves but aren't physically coupled to us and so are invisible to us the way dark matter is, is uh, pretty much invisible to us. Um, and so, as you say, time and space would be, the, the roles of them would be transposed for, for tachyonic matter, if it exists. It's freaky, man. So, <laughs> you know, we haven't done your book justice because there's so much more to it. I mean, you do, we mentioned that you get into string theory, you get into a bunch of, and you get into a bunch of mathematical stuff, infinities and Cantor, and, uh, and you get a, a little into God, you have a, there's like your review of Richard Dawkins's book, and there's a ton of stuff in here. Um, you get into David Foster Wallace. I didn't, I didn't, I see, I haven't read him. I didn't realize he was quite as uh, serious uh, in thinking about the actual math of infinity as apparently he was, but, Very serious, yeah. uh, but, 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 um, so there's a ton of stuff and, and it's a very impressive with... testament to the way you've been spending your, your time. It's, it's an impressive body of work and everyone, uh, everyone should check it out. One closing question, like, how did you get to be like this? Did you study math in college or what i mean you you you're really deeply interested in these in yeah. the, this intersection of math and science and philosophy when i when i arrived at college i in high school i i had uh, uh, i used to talk to bf skinner on the telephone really I, yeah i i got his number from the cambridge uh, directory uh, information and uh, called him up cold 
and I was just a kid, and um, he, he liked me, and he encouraged me to call him. He would always be maybe a little swiffy, and he would say, oh, my critics don't understand me, and, and I loved Walden, too. This and, is crazy. When was and, this? Yeah. This was in the uh, in, in, in the early seventies, and when he was already. You know, I, as a high school student in the early seventies, I read his book Beyond Freedom and Dignity, yes. and it actually had a deep impact on me. Yeah, so in Walden too, did you? I'm sure you read, I read that. Read that in college. Okay. I read that in college. And so I was I was interested in um, in uh, in psychology and psychiatry, and I wanted to be a, a doctor to have psychiatric credentials, uh, and so pre med. Uh, and I had to take all of these inane courses like organic chemistry. And meanwhile, all the cool kids were talking about Galois theory and differential equations and group and quantum theory. And, and uh, so I finished up all my uh, pre-med requirements and, and had an extra year in which I could just do what I wanted. So I thought, oh, I'll try you know, philosophy and mathematics. I'll take you know, courses in pure mathematics. And uh, I was kind of good at it because I like reasoning in an abstract way. And, uh, uh, and I... And I liked the way it dovetailed with philosophy, uh, and uh, I love mathematical logic. And I, so I lost interest in medical school, and um, uh, and kind of, and I got a master's degree in mathematics. I came to New York to go to Studio Fifty Four because that that's a you know obvious thing for uh, aspiring mathematicians. You used to hang out with Diane Keaton, right? I, I, I had dinner with Di- I had dinner with Diane Keaton and Bette Midler in the same week, and then the next week with William Buckley, and I thought. When I'm surrounded by rich, famous, powerful, glamorous people like this, I'll be successful by sheer osmosis. That's uh-huh. a bad theory. It didn't work for me. So like you, I declined into journalism. And so ever since then, I've been playing catch up and I've been trying to uh, you know, it, learn new mathematical fields, learn about physics, teach myself general relativity theory. I, I go to conferences with physicists and philosophers of physics, we fly to the Canary Islands or the French Riviera, and then we sit in a windowless room and scream at each other about the nature of space and time and quantum entanglement. And uh, it's just, it's a, it's a great life. And I don't know anything it, it very deeply. I'm sort of a, a dilettante, but, um, but a, a, a rigorous dilettante, I like to think. Okay. So that's my okay. apologia for my existence. Okay. A fox, a fox, not a hedgehog. Fox is a slightly more flattering term. I'm actually a hedgehog. hedgehog. I have, I have one guiding idea. Uh, I, I, I won't share it with you though, because you'll, you'll, you'll trivialize it. <laughs> Will you tell me off camera? Uh, no, my guiding idea. It's, it's, it's not a very interesting one. My big idea is that our ability to frame meaningful claims about reality is essentially limited by our experience and observation. So this is a big idea that I use to deflate other big ideas. And it's a very unpopular big idea now among philosophers and physicists because it sounds like logical positivism, that nothing is meaningful unless it can be empirically verified. My big idea is not quite that vulgar, not quite that simplistic, but it, it's kind of like that. And it, well, it, say it again. Let me make sure I've soaked it up. It's simply this, that the parts of reality that we can make meaningful claims about our ability to make meaningful claims about reality is essentially limited by our experience and our observation. So therefore, I'm, I, I don't believe in a lot of metaphysics. I believe that oh, the controversy over the true interpretation of quantum mechanics is a, uh, a false it one. Seems, I think Kurt Gerdel would disagree with you because oh, I, it seems to me, yeah. he would, right? Because it seems to me like, yeah. uh, if I say, no, you're wrong, I can make a meaningful claim about metaphysics that may, or I may not be able to verify it, but I can make the claim is kind of analogous to him, his saying, within a mathematical system, you can make claims that may, that, that may turn out to be true or beyond the, you, the capacity of your experience and knowledge to prove, but are nonetheless true. So, so yes. he would... Uh, to... to, to um... Girdle's, the, the, the Girdle proposition, I am not provable. Roger Penrose says, we know that that's true. And, you know, why do we know it's true? Because what it says can obviously, uh, it has to be true uh, on pain of contradiction. But under another interpretation, it's not true. And so uh, I'm not explaining this, I'm doing it hurriedly and not very clearly. But the point is that Girdle and Sir Roger Penrose and people of that ilk think that the mind has the power to somehow pick out the intended model of arithmetic uh, 
in a way that goes beyond our descriptive powers. Our descriptive powers are you know, what we can say in mathematical language. But no, we can actually go beyond our descriptive powers and our minds can buy you know, kind of noetic rays, focus on this intended mathematical reality. Uh, I see no way to, uh, to uh, vindicate that epistemologically. There's no way that the mind doesn't have these transcendent powers. Mm. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah. I, um, well, I'm with you in a way. I mean, I, 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 at least I would go so far as to say I think there are, well, you do believe there are truths that we will never apprehend probably, right? Not that, not that we can formulate. That we yeah, can't formulate. Well, um, I'm kind of with you there. I think, like, I think, for example, the problem with How do you be convinced that that's the case? Like, with, in the case of consciousness, I suspect that we're not even capable of formulating whatever the correct answer is, if there is such a thing. We, we formulated the problem in a confused way, which uh, makes its resolution impossible. But how could you, what could convince you that there are parts of reality and that there are truths about reality that we could never uh, understand? Well, maybe you could encounter some transhuman extraterrestrials and they come and they start, you know, making noises or they start using some sort of system that we say, oh, that's a symbol system. It's a language. So what are they talking about? then we have to sort of figure out a way to translate what they're talking about into our language. So we come up with a translation manual. And in order to come up with a translation manual, we have to assume that there's a huge overlap in what they consider to be true and what we consider to be true. Mm -hmm. Eventually we translate these propositions into something that we can understand. Uh, and, um, you know, thereby rendering, you know, bringing them into our conceptual framework. If we can't bring something into our conceptual framework from their transhuman framework, then do we say they're thinking they're, they're uh, in touch with some aspect of reality that's beyond us, or we just got a bad translation manual. Mm -hmm. So you, it's, you, you, it, you mustn't be naive about the fact that all of this stuff is in the medium of language. And, uh, if you're talking about metaphysics, you have to have a theory of understanding and a theory of reference and a theory of meaning that undergirds your metaphysical talk. Uh, so you, it sounds like you would like late Wittgenstein. I like late Wittgenstein, and that's, he's, he's very out of fashion now. Uh, another philosopher I like is uh, Michael Dummett, uh, an Oxford philosopher who uh, died about uh, five or six years ago, who was, who was a... Uh, uh, a, a, you know, a, a very strong anti-Platonist, and he, and, and, and not just when I say anti, strong anti-Platonist, it's not just a matter of uh, of uh, you know philosophical temperament or predilection. It's a matter of saying if you believe there are these metaphysical entities, I want to know how you refer to them, how the the uh, language you use succeeds in referring to them, and I want to know what your theory of meaning is and what your theory of understanding is. Yeah. And increasingly now, when I talk to philosophers who are very cavalier in speaking about uh, the way reality is in itself. And I say, well, you know, how are you, how do you know that your use of the term uh, quark refers to, you know, some bit of reality out there that's, you know, that's an object that's, uh, you know, distinguished from other objects. And they say, I don't have a theory of reference. I don't have a theory of meaning. I'm worried about the philosophy of physics. Now you have to have a complete philosophical outlook to make sure that your, your, your discourse is, is, is sensical rather than nonsense. I'm sorry, that was very long-winded, but no, I feel like I, I think I, I, I think I like Lee Wittgenstein, but it's interesting that you said uh, what you, your view could be mistaken for like vulgar positivism, because I think his view, you know, was mistaken by some, I mean, his famous thing, what's his famous line like that about which, if you don't know anything, you shouldn't say, that about, that we do, whatever, the things you don't understand, person. we shouldn't say anything about. Yeah, where, whereof we cannot speak, there we must yeah, remain. That was, that, that was taken by some, I think, as just positivism. Uh, in other words, taken to mean that if you can't speak about it, it has no meaning. And, uh, and, and, and I don't, I, I think the more common interpretation now is that what he was saying was, almost a little more mystical in the respectable sense of mystical, in the sense of just uh, respecting the limits of language when it comes to uh, articulating all of reality. Yeah, but that, that, that of course was early Wittgenstein. That's the last line of the Tractatus that you quoted. In late Wittgenstein, he also was very concerned about the limits of language, but he had a very different idea of them. But the, the, just one concluding point, 
the problem of consciousness, which you alluded to, uh, and which seems to be insoluble. No one has any notion of how to even begin addressing the problem of consciousness, uh, except for crazy theories like panpsychism, that every that con you know electrons are conscious and so forth. It's built into the structure of reality. Um, he had an argument called the private language argument uh, that you know undermines the very idea that we have these essentially private mental states, which philosophers now call qualia or raw feels. Right. Uh, and, um, if, if, and so for Leif Wittgenstein, this whole problem of consciousness never gets off the ground because it, it does go beyond what can be expressed in a public language. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and, and philosophy has forgotten that now. Uh, and um, I think that's, we're now, uh, philosophers of mind are spinning their wheels, you know, it, it, in, in, in a futile quest for something that Wittgenstein showed wasn't possible. And then, you know, I think Daniel Dennett uh, has the right idea about this and he's reviled for. Uh, we do disagree then. We do disagree. We well, have a whole nother it would be a dull world if we all agreed, wouldn't it? What? It would be, a, it would be a, worse it would be a dull world. world if we all thought alike. We should have a whole nother conversation on things we disagree on. It sounds like consciousness in this, along this dimension may be one of them, but certainly the book has a, uh, Tons of stuff that could sustain a whole nother uh, conversation. There really is a ton of fascinating yeah, stuff. Like why, why is death bad? Why is why life is death bad? Right. Why is life absurd? And why does a mirror reverse left and right, but not up and down? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's you that's. Know, that's I, you know, I came across that. There was a column in the San Francisco Chronicle when I was like twelve years old, and we lived in San Francisco. What was that famous? columnist name damn he was super famous he was Art Gardner uh no it was in the San Francisco Chronicle oh no actually it wasn't the famous column it was another column anyway he just threw that out there as a, as a little koan and I puzzled over it anyway good question uh many of them in this book uh when Einstein walked with Gerdel or Gerdel as you prefer uh excursions to the edge of thought and really Jim let's have another conversation we can Great fun. I really enjoyed it. Really? Same here. So thank you. We'll see you soon. Okay.